Hey, I didn't realise you're a handsome, fashionable <laughs> man. Uh, no, well, it's not. <laughs> we're on. We're on. Much, by the way, I we've started the show. Much time, no, I wanted to start this. You've come into the studio. You smell good. You look good. <laughs> you've got just the most beautiful fitting clothes. Uh, thanks. You're a clean individual. Oh yeah, thank you. Um, <laughs> I'm kind of blushing. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, well, all credit has to go to my wife. It's funny, you know, like since I've started working in the real world. Yes. Um, Welcome. One of the great stresses. <laughs> Has been getting dressed every day. Oh. I'm like, like, like when I would go to training, I just chuck on tracky pants, and and particularly with COVID, I literally wore the same clothes. Yeah. Two years straight, like there was like a winter kit and a summer kit to training and to home. Whereas now I'm like, got a meeting today, going here today. Mm. Like, what am I going to wear? Mm. Stressing me. Hard. Does that? Do, but when you were playing though, did you always sort of treat the boys some days and just come in real hot? Did you yeah, have those well, days like, when that you want to? Early days, yeah. like. <laughs> As I got older, I just didn't give a shit anymore. Um, and like with kids and married, I was like, whatever. But early days, it was like every day I would try and come in like feeling good. Yeah. It was like that whole yeah. look good, feel good kind yeah. of thing. And um, But yeah, I dropped that. You're, you're very classy now. We were just talking before. I feel like black on black, venture out to some navy, maybe a <laughs> bit of grey. But I can imagine you back in maybe... Because like for me something that sticks out to like a nostalgic demons player was like Mark Jamar. <laughs> oh man. And like, they were my fashion influence. That's what I meant. Days. And I can imagine him, him Brett, Maloney. Brett Maloney and wearing like cargo, like pants <laughs> with like a big travesty t-shirt or uh, something. We would roll like, uh, well, I remember early days, like leopard. I mean, not leopard. Uh, <laughs> oh, leopard, <wow. laughs> leopard. Snake skin shoes, like tight oh. jeans, like V neck t-shirt. Yeah. Like, and I look back now, I'm like, what was I thinking? Yeah. Um, but yeah, like I'm very much a neutral. Yeah, you look good. I was all black, mm. but I have, I have tried to add some sort of like this is this is out there for me. Yeah, it's cool. What do you like? Oh, we're getting way too into this now. But what are your <laughs> like? Have you got those go-to brands? Because I've got a couple that I just stick with now. Uh, so my generic ones are there's a brand called Handsome that I love in Fitzroy, Uniqlo. Yeah. Is just like I go there a bit for uni- t-shirts mainly. Uniqlo is the most underrated shop in yeah, yeah. the world. And also um, massively underrated one. I don't even like giving this one out because it's so underrated. Cotton on. Cotton on. I well, I'll admit, all, my entire underwear drawer is cotton on. Yeah, yeah. They're, <laughs> like, elite. they're elite. They're elite. They got some good stuff. Um, check it out. Anyway, man, welcome to the show. Thank you. How are you? I'm very well. Yeah. Is this like the? This would be like obviously I've had the pleasure of gracing um, the field with maybe once. I think it's the first time I've sat down and had a chat. I reckon. Well, it would have to be. Well, I, it definitely remember. would be. Yeah, I would have de- said g'day. <laughs> yeah, I definitely remember. Um, great to meet you. I know Likewise. a lot about you. And obviously we do research. Bruce Sam, Hanson Darcy, they love doing research. Today, have you found, um, I'm sure you'd be aware of this, but on Wikipedia, the first time when you type your name into Google, yes. you're actually the second person that comes I up. I know. Famous <laughs> American. No, he's Australian. Is he Australian? Australian. WWE wrestler wrestler and yeah, there's yeah. a there's a and I think he's been an uncanny jail. is it I'm pretty sure Shit. I've done a little bit of research there's an uncanny it. bit of a resemblance there as well <laughs> yeah, yeah absolutely Rigosaurus. I'm not quite as built no he's um he's six foot eleven <laughs> holy fuck I didn't know that so he's six foot eleven two hundred so two hundred eleven centimeters one hundred forty five kilos yeah man anyway <laughs> moving on um that's interesting what's been happening with you freshly retired mm-hmm. um. You've gone, there's two ways you can go with retirement. You've sort of made us all look real bad. And you're sort of the one that's like going straight into like doing Ironmans and shit. Like, no, but what the fuck? The reason why, there's some context to it. Okay. Like, uh, um, well, like obviously off the back of everything with the season finishing and my career finishing and then obviously adding two babies into the mix at mm. home, which takes, takes my tally at home to four. Far out. I was like, I need to take a breath. And just chill. Um, Do anything to get out of the house. Well, that that's where it came in, kind of thing. Um, <laughs> so yeah, I just uh, I I decided I was going to take twelve months off, which it only eventuated to being five or six. But mm. that was an awesome period. Like I just wanted to focus on being around the kids and being present and um, sort of enjoying some stuff and the freedom that you know I I guess I didn't have when I, you were playing footy, mm. um, which you'd know, and. But then part of that, I sort of worried about not having any structure um, and like routine because it's like I don't, I've only ever lived that way. Like you say, 16 years of footy, but like I was probably living like that from you know maybe 10, like just being involved in heaps of sport and training and like just regular. 
so i was like a bit concerned about just like leaving it open yeah um and i'd had a few i'd always been interested in the fact that i was fit and i had the time i was like i'm gonna have a crack at doing a um half ironman uh, ultimate gold i'd love to do like hawaii wow um so half iron what's a half, half ironman? ironman so like ironman triathlon which is the most famous one would yep. be the hawaiian ironman yeah you know, that's 3.8k swim 180k bike and then you run a marathon oh my god so it's essentially what i did was half that yeah right so 1.9 90 21.1 oh that's cute man <laughs> he's done that that's he's cute. done it that's cute what time do you punch no, out is, for that by the this way this is my melbourne marathon yeah though. i know yeah <laughs> um no we don't talk about the times I completed, I completed <laughs> completion no, i uh i did a just under four hours 350 oh nice yeah um, but i don't I don't know how you ran, swam, and biked. In, like it's just that blows yeah. my mind. No matter the yeah. distance, like was, the, the like lactic I've, off the legs as yeah, well. Yeah. Like. Well, I put a I put a fair bit of time in. Like I, and I never you finished really, in the top thirty, thirty four, yeah, was it? something like that. Yeah, um, I was like top fifteen in my age, maybe. Wow. Like, maybe I think it might have been ninth. Don't quote me on that. I don't know. That was good fun. I, I like I said, I, I sort of got stuck. Originally, my plan was I'm going to keep running to stay fit and yeah. it was getting me out of the house uh, early days. And I was going to do Melbourne, but then I just never done any training. Like I did when I was younger, but obviously playing footy, it's so different it's so to these different. kind of endurance sports. Yeah. And I was just like, after three or four weeks of like trying to build up the miles and stuff, I was like ruined. I'm like, oh. I need someone to help me. And I think doing Melbourne was too quick. So then I sort of looked in the calendar and like, March seemed like enough time. Yeah. So then I just got stuck into like a 12 week program, which was pretty fun. And it gave me the structure I was after. Yeah. And then, yeah, I just got really stuck into it. Like I did triathlons when I was a kid, a little bit, raced like junior nationals and stuff like that. So then I was like, it was sort of like a quite nostalgic that I was doing it again. Like I'd gone full circle and I was back competing which was fun and what um, were you like as a runner like playing footy you're obviously good is that your, like, um yeah like i'm definitely my strength is endurance, endurance. Yeah, yeah 100 yeah. Percent. what would you um, be getting like 2k um like oh, i reckon we sort of did four 1ks mm. like around that six yeah, minute yeah. mark oh wow 620 ish maybe oh, i reckon 615 um yeah around princess we used to do 3ks around around there all the time they sucked um yeah like multiple of pre-season wow but then I reckon I, I don't know, clocked a 9.30 something around oh, there. That's unbelievable. That was back in, that was like so funny, man. When we were real bad as a team, we were an elite group of runners. Like I reckon at one point, <laughs> <Damn> <laughs> way. It's so is random, that? man. Yeah. Like, I reckon at one point, uh, Tommy McDonald would know this, but I reckon we had 10 or 12 guys that could run under 10 minutes for 3K, which is elite as far as like a footy team goes. Unbelievable. Um, yeah, I reckon the average losing margin that year would have been bloody 75 points. <laughs> Man, you would know, like, you know, I've got a small glimmer in, into this of, of playing at, at a team that, you know, hasn't performed to the stage. But I played at Carlton and went to the Giants and didn't really play there. But I, <laughs> I trained with them. And I swear to God, it's so much harder losing than it is winning. Yeah, 100%. Like, you, you actually... You know, like fans and everyone, they're like, "Oh, this team, they had to work hard." It's like, man, I'm telling you right now, the you teams work that are way the, harder. Yeah, the teams that are at the bottom of the ladder are working double, double. as hard at the teams at the top. Yeah, they're just nowhere near as efficient. And um, and I, you know, I guess that's one part of my journey that I was sort of lucky enough to see both ends of that yeah. spectrum, really. Um, and it's so obvious, like, you know, I just remember those dark days. You feel like you're dragging your ass, and you've really actually, you know, run way further and way harder than you oh. normally because you're just chasing and trying to put pressure on but they're just almost running rings you're around. trying too hard yeah you yeah, are which is weird um interesting interesting hey take us back um nathan jones as a, as a young man where'd you grow up what were you like as a kid what's your um, first memories um down from down the mornington peninsula mm. grew up was you a stingray yep yeah uh i grew up mount eliza sort of mornington area Beautiful. played all my junior footy at um mount eliza red legs down there mm which is funnily enough all demons colors demons song so uh yeah i've sort of never shaken that of uh port arlington too and yes and this is the other ironic thing so the team i'm playing for in the carlton draft port arlington demons is all the Far same out. <laughs> so it's like that's hectic yeah it's like transcended from the moment i was like what six or seven then i started playing there literally the mainstay team that I played in, other than representative sides, always wore red and blue and sung the 
the same theme song. Okay, this is a way off topic question, <laughs> but I think because you're a fashion, you're a fashionista man. What would be? And I know you're your demon through and through. But was there ever a jumper where you were like, oh, that's for, I'd love to wear that jumper? Because I know I used to think about that heaps. Like, I had this thing around the well, Swans I'll, jumper. I love their jumper. I just reckon it's a cool... Yeah, I, it's like I, I actually agree jumpers. with that. That's, they do have a good kit. Yeah. I probably would have just been like the black and white version of Collingwood yeah. or Port yeah. that I liked. I don't mind Richmond's kit. I'm not massive on the, the I don't mind. I don't mind it. Yeah. Um. Yeah, I don't know. I haven't anyway, really given that yeah, much thought. Don't, well, you don't have to anyway. You, you, <laughs> I don't have yeah, to, yeah. you still play the Ds. Um, so yeah, grew up in Mount Eliza, playing yep. footy there. Um, and then went to Peninsula Grammar. Went to primary school there, Peninsula Grammar. Got a um, sports scholarship. Yeah. Or general excellence, I guess they called it back in the day. But um, And yeah, I just, you know, just lived down there. Lived a pretty um, sort of cruisy life. Mum and dad and two other brothers, younger. So there's one in between me and Zach. Zach plays at the Saints, obviously, yep. and um, and Josh. He's a plumber, runs his own company now, and he still lives down there. Mum and Dad are still down there. Um, Zach's sort of up near me around Bayside now, and and yeah, like we, uh, I was just right into sport as a kid. Mum and Dad always sort of encouraged us to go down that path, sort of keep us out of trouble <clears> and <throat> keep us occupied. Like a lot of energy in our house with the three of us, and um, a fair bit of trouble. And, uh, and yeah, so sport was always that avenue to sort of blow some steam off and run us ragged. And, uh, and yeah, and we lived in a, it was funnily enough, we lived in a court for most of my childhood. My greatest memory is living in a court in, uh, in a street in Mount Eliza or in a court in Mount Eliza. And, uh, there's like three boys in our house, three boys in the house next door, two boys in the house next door to that. And we backed onto a primary school. So like we had the greatest backyard oh, ever. Sick. Um, and we'd just be out like uh, I remember all the houses they had like an old school bell because like we'd be all just in the school after after school we'd be in the primary school just like playing footy and skating cricket basketball anything like when we just use the whole school grounds and all their facilities which was epic Um, but yeah it was was good times and um, yeah like pretty successful as a junior sports um, athlete uh, I was, and I sort of went a little bit of an alternative way to most kids like you know I guess the Australian way is you play footy and mm. in uh, <clears throat> footy in winter and cricket basketball those kind of sports in summer but I was right into sort of like swimming and athletics cross country um, like a lot of running and all that kind of thing and um, yeah I never really played I didn't play any of those other sports other than footy my old man got me into surfing when I was young skated a bit um and yeah so like most of the time i would i sort of translated those couple of skills with you know being swimming was like a i guess that was a necessity for me to want to be uh want to go surfing on my own so my old man like sort of set me the task of like if i wrote uh if i reach squad squad level in swimming which is i don't know if it's still the same now but then he would have the faith in me to be able to um you know go surfing on my own and funnily enough, I actually was pretty good at swimming. And and similar, well, like running was uh, the same, you know, like all through that sort of junior schools, you know, state and national stuff. I did a bit of that and put them together in the summer for one bit over, you know, between sort of the ages 14, 16, did a bit of triathlons. But then, you know, foot, as you know, as you, you get to sort of 15, 16, footy becomes pretty serious and mm. playing rep footy. And in my case, you know, with private school, you play school footy and... Yes, yeah, just get too busy. I love what your um, what your old man did with the the swimming and the yeah. ocean. Like, I think now like we're living in Sydney. I'm massive. Like, ocean was my thing. Like every day there, but there was still parts that like because I didn't grow up around it yeah. all the time. Like I was from Melbourne. I went to the down in Bowen Heads all the time. But if you don't learn the ocean from like a young age or even how to swim comfortably, it's a fucking scary place. Yeah, like, man. And I, whenever I have kids, the first thing they're doing is like nippers to like learn how to swim in the ocean because yeah. being comfortable in the ocean is like one of the most underrated skills you can have yeah 100 percent. i think particularly in australia as well like i still find it funny that people are scared you know mm. um but it's just like foreign for me to even think that way because 
of being comfortable in it from yeah. such a young age. Even just like rips and stuff like that. Like yeah. the knowledge of getting out of rips. Man, yeah, I got stuck 100%. in one of fucking at backpackers <laughs> ripping Bondi. Like, yeah. I nearly drowned. I like, this is mate. when I was like 26, man. Like, <laughs> I, it was so embarrassing. I took a mate. Uh, well, I've got a funny story. I took a mate um, surfing. He's like, oh, I want to go surfing. We went to Gunamata down the peninsula. Quite notorious for sort of rips and mm. being a lot um, unpredictable. And, you know, we all sort of paddle out there. And I don't think he picked up that there was sort of a rip running through and I didn't really say anything. But next minute, like, I'm paddling for waves and surfing and a couple of us are as well. And we're, like, looking around, like, where's Jimmy? And he's, like, miles out, like, oh. so far past us. Um, you know, at least 100, 150. And you see the rubber dinghy come out from down where the flags are, <laughs> pick him up. And we all go in, like... And it's all we'll stand on the shore. It's like, and he's got the walk of shame. And oh, he, oh. he gets off the, he's like, you know, 25 year old with a surfboard and a wetsuit. Looks like the real deal. And he's being carried in on the rubber duck in. It's a walk of shame down the beach back to all the boys. It's hilarious. Oh, mate, that was me <laughs> at, at Bondi too. Like, if, if Bondi Rescue was there, I would have been on the, yeah. next, on the next series. It's that, that's how bad it was. But yeah, bloody scary. Bloody scary. Shout out to Jimmy. I know he's been better. <laughs> um, junior, juniors as well, Peninsula growing up, because you were pick 13. Pick 12, 12. Pick 12. Yeah. Who was um, around your age? Who was playing with you? Like, who were the guys you were coming through the system with? Oh, I came through with, like, uh, Pendles and Daisy Thomas. We, we played Murph. off Murph, definitely. Yeah, we played together in the Metro side. Daisy and Pendles and a couple of others. I don't think played for too, too long, but uh, that sort of Gippsland power area. Mm. Uh, that year, Stingrays and Gippsland played off in the grand final. I think it might have been the last year they played as a curtain raiser attack cup yeah. um, for the grand final. Um, yeah, there's a there's a fair few guys like Paddy Ryder was in my draft. You know, Higgins, Hearn. That's a, it was a pretty good draft. Anyone? So Pendles would be the only one. Pendles still, still going. Yeah. Yeah. Pretty good sure. Draft. Oh, Paddy Ryder. Paddy Ryder. Yeah. Paddy Ryder as well. Yeah, super draft. Um, First memories of getting picked up to the D's? What? what uh, I was pretty relieved, to be honest. Staying in Melbourne? Or yeah. Just, yeah. Um, like, there was a fair bit of interest from West Coast, and they were the next pick. So, oh. you know, I don't know what would have happened, obviously, if uh, if I didn't get taken by the D's, but could have could have been very different. Um, what was it? Just like young, but didn't want to leave Melbourne? Or yeah, just, I don't yeah. know. I was just like, I was very much a homebody. Yeah. Like, I love my own space and i enjoyed the comfort of being around like mm. family and friends and stuff and it's just that the thought of that change i would have gone for sure probably yeah. been would have been totally fine yeah um but yeah i think i guess at that age and i was underage for that draft but i think again this that same year was the last year where you could get drafted underage so i was only 17 love that i don't know it was just quite daunting for me to think um about that but yeah, yeah. anyway didn't eventuate and um yeah, off I went to the D's. I was pretty pumped. Like, they were a pretty good side. Yeah. And, Neil um, Danaher was coach? Neil Danaher coach. Um, and they had a lot of good players and quite a successful, like, I think he was coach for 10 years. And they made finals, a fair few of those, um, or most of those, I'm pretty sure. And, yeah, um, you know, you walk in, David Neitz, Uze, crazy. Bruce, um, Travis Johnson was like, he lived in Chelsea and I still lived in Mornington. So he'd, like, drive me to train. I didn't even have a license at the time. Um, and yeah, there was just like Brad Green. There was just so many well um, known like Melbourne players of that sort of early two thousand era. You know, they played in the Granny in two thousand, and as I mentioned, you know, they played finals a fair bit. So yeah, I was pretty excited. Um, but it was weird. Like it just wasn't what I anticipated. Now looking back, like we didn't really have a base as far as like a you know a home ground like we were out of junction oval which when i walked into junction oval i was like man like my school facilities or my local footy club are yeah. almost better than this yeah. you know it's like uh i think you i don't know if you've heard many guys talk about it but it's like possums climbing out of the roofs and like rats and mice and stuff and yeah it was just not what i anticipated um but you know at the same time you know looking back you can really admire like that group under danners with the limited sort of uh, facilities and opportunities they had in that regard, like they did a bloody good job to be the, the quality of team that they were um, for so many years. 
it was interesting like pre-season sort of hopped around like i'd drive from mornington we'd go to trinity playing fields mm. to do training back to junction to do weights go to msac or the beach to do some sort of recovery and then jump in the car and drive back home that was most days in pre-season early years and yeah it was it started off pretty good and then and she went for a bit yeah well there's some sh- there's a roller coaster that's, that's <laughs> it was um it's crazy to sit in now and think like about your career and, and being somewhere for for such a long time like 300 games and you're, you're going to go down as, as a club legend you already are but it's you're there forever like it's incredible it's an honor to be here with yeah, you. it really is thanks. congratulations thanks mate but how crazy is it to think like when one thing that i do now that i'm finished footy is when players debut and you know you get like a player number yeah and I remember my Carlton player number was like 1145 and my Giants number was something like 200 or something like that because there's, there's less. But one thing's crazy is now when you see players debut and they get their number and you go, fuck, there's been that many players go yeah, through man. since me. I know. Can you, Have you ever done the maths of like working out how many people nah, well, you've seen come through the club? Like, I think it's like, oh man, that's like, particularly through, if you just went on that decade where we struggled as a club, our average turnover would have had to have been 10 players more i reckon like oh that's what i mean like yeah. just average like they'd, they'd be turning at least you know somewhere between 10 and 15 over every year yeah um as we like replenish the list and trade it in and out and you know bring draft picks in like it was a hectic time a lot of turmoil and um you know it was just you know there's not um uh, you know it wasn't a very sort of steady or stable mm. period um but we can get to that but yeah it's uh i think uh, i guess my position in all of that like um yep. you know i think about the club like i think there's some crazy uh i guess things about melbourne footy club like it's something like the the oldest sporting club in australia and it may even be one of the oldest i think it is one of the oldest sporting clubs in the world i can't really remember exactly yep. it's either it's i reckon it might be in the top three potentially but don't quote me on that again i can't quite remember but yeah, so then when you think about that, like being around for, you know, 180 plus years, like, um, yeah, it's pretty cool that I sort of sit right up there as far as sort of games played and years spent there. And, um, yeah, it's, uh, I never had never really reflected on it too much. Probably have more so in the last five or six months. But, mm. yeah, it's pretty cool. It's unbelievable, man. It's unbelievable. It's in the history books forever. <laughs> it's so super crazy. Um Let's go back to, to that early career. So you get to the D's going pretty well. I think in your fifth game, you're playing in like finals. Yeah, so I... Well, Dana sort of... Oh, well, the team was real good. Like, really good, um, yeah. We finished fifth that season and it took me 16 rounds to get in. Obviously, a team that's going that well, sort of finishing the top five or six teams of the comp. It's got a pretty strong midfield and Dana's, uh, you know, wanted me to sort of realign and learn some really key lessons i think and uh you know i had to earn my spot in the side which you know i look back on that and so i'm sort of grateful for that journey rather than you know first round draft pick i think you can sort of come in and think it you you should be you're entitled to an opportunity Mm -hmm. kind of thing but i definitely had to sort of earn my stripes and play the right way and all those kind of things and um you know i guess put the runs on the board which you know, I enjoyed that because I sort of always looked when I got drafted that, yes, I finally made it, but actually there's yeah, a hell of a long way to yeah. go kind of thing. And this is only the start. So, yeah, I enjoyed that first period. I debuted against the um, Dogs at the G, Adam Uze's 250th game. It's a pretty cool day. And, um, you know, I get to walk off. We won um, sort of arm in arm with Uze as he celebrates his 250th and I play my first. Um and then, yeah, it was pretty fun finish to that season. I ended up playing eight games and I was a mad Saints fan as a kid. Um, and, you know, we made finals. Uh, you know, my, what was it? Must have been my sixth game. Last game of the season, whatever that was. Sixth game, yeah. Um, I think we, had to, we went down to Geelong, played Geelong and Geelong. And there's a lot of stories of Geelong and Geelong. Not many good ones from yeah. my career. But, uh I remember this one because it's like we're, we're fighting out for a top four and we end up having a draw. So uh, that sort of pushed us down to fifth. We had an elimination finals and um, we ended up playing St Kilda first final. Uh, as I said before, I was a mad Saints fan. 
and uh, I'm like end up um, Robert Harvey was like my idol yeah like posters on the wall like war 35 like just wanted to be like him like wore puma footy boots and his socks up jumper tucked in just so to be like him and um and yeah I end up lining up on him for the first bounce of that game kind of thing and um yeah that was like a real pinch me moment because I was just like I practically still half backed for the Saints, yeah. you know. Like, um, I wasn't long enough entrenched in the sort of Melbourne system, and you know, um, to not still admire the fact that I was playing on my childhood hero. So that was pretty cool. And then we go to Perth, and just weren't good enough. Mm. We were in the game till half time, and Freo were just too good. Mm. When did it, I suppose in with Melbourne? Did it start to sort of click that things weren't? like on a downward trajectory was there a time that you sort of yeah, it's remember? probably halfway through that second year that second year yeah yeah um we didn't start the year that great <clears throat> bit of inconsistency um i can't quite remember the reasons but you know i think mid-year dan has stood down as coach mm-hmm. so then i had my second coach we had um, bomber riley come in and take over as a caretaker for the rest of that season and yeah sort of from that point on like you know then we went into the um what was it the sort of dean bailey era after that and you know there's an exodus of some senior players and you know we we were, we came good at certain times under bales played some pretty good footy but the gap between our best and worst was still quite significant and then obviously you know you go so fast forward through that period, we're actually sort of climbing back up the ladder just outside the eight at one point. I remember we smashed Swans at the G, like 90 points. And mm. you know, there was a lot of um, positive talk about the club and you know, we'd acquired some talent through draft picks and stuff. And but then we had that bloody infamous loss down at the Cattery. And, yes. uh, and I think that's set, that was like 186 points. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and that... Um, I, I think that sort of just sent us backwards again. You know, the club made some um, some big decisions like following that game, sacked Bales, and and then yeah, sort of lost its way as an organisation. I think you know then we sort of fast track into the Neil De era. Similar sort of things happen really. You know, um, comes in and does a little bit of an excess again of sort of what senior players we had left and. Um, yeah, we just struggled as a club. We never really clicked under Neody and, you know, the losses mounted in his second year. He was gone as well. <laughs> yeah, it was kind of scary because it was like, one was, okay, but then like, happens another time, another time. It's like, man, this is like crazy. Like by the time I, what's that? Almost uh, you know, probably eight years into my career, seven or eight years into my career, I've already had like, what, three, four, five, five or six coaches mm. with caretakers and coaches. So, um, yeah, that was, a, that was a crazy period. Um, and then we sort of started to come out of it as we uh, – probably the worst loss under Neody was – I think it was the second season. Like, I reckon first four games of the year we lost – like we got crushed, crushed by West Coast. I remember losing at the G to War Essendon. I reckon it was like 150 points. We got like booed off the ground. Fuck. Like throwing stuff at us, throwing scars and memberships. And yeah, that was like, that was grim. Um, yeah, I still, that, that, that game in particular, like the 186 was like, we're in Geelong and once you got off the ground, I was, there's a, a there's a tough period, yeah. There's a lot of sort of shame associated with it, mm. like particularly after those losses. You know what it's like. You need to ride the lows and the highs, obviously. But going through that period, it's funny because I'm speaking in a couple of weeks, or actually next week, at the Norm Smith Oration Night for the MCC. So it's all this stuff that you're asking me about my career is like quite um, like front of mind because I've sort of gone back over it to mm. pull together a speech and um, sort of brings up a lot of that re- emotion from that period where, you know... Um, you sort of buried it away and almost like lived like for a lot of my career like it was almost like survival mechanisms kind of thing just to get through and um yeah it's uh let me get to the sort of peter jackson paul ruse era and the club 
found its way again after a little bit of time. It's interesting, isn't it? Like, and not putting in words in your mouth, this is more my opinion on, on things. Like I, as I said, I've been a part of a club similar to that on similar trajectories. And like, you feel like sometimes, as we said earlier, the harder you try, the, the harder it gets. And also what happens is too, um, especially when these things are happening, you go, all right, reactive, let's sack the coach. Let's turn over the list. Let's get new people in power. Those people come in, they want to make changes. They bring people in, they want to make changes. Yeah. Those changes don't work. Fuck it. Let's sack those people. Oh, yeah. Let's change the list. Let's do it well, again. That's basically what happened. Man. It does. It was like a full on like rat race. Like, yeah. Which then it's funny because then I obviously saw the progression from, from that sort of next phase. And really it's like the leadership and the um, alignment from the top down. And it's like having everyone on the same page pushing in the same direction that's not to say that you can't like deviate on that path but mm. yeah you know, you've got to get the buy-in and get the right sort of leadership and skills in the right positions and i think that's what the club did mm. i guess reflecting on that like real difficult time was like there's a heap of uh you know people ask me like why like why why did you stay through that stuff like mm. i think for me it's like i look back to when i was a kid and you know it's like personal traits of like you know hard work and loyalty and um i guess never giving up and those kind of things and i guess the more i sort of you know conceptualize the situation i was like i couldn't really deal with my own conscience if i was to walk away from it because i feel like i was sort of cheating on myself like i got this far through through you know fighting through whatever sort of obstacle was put in my way so sort of every time i considered like my contract situation i was like nah because how good would it be like i just had this vision from early days like when we struggled in the early years it's like it's going to be epic like we'll get through this period imagine when we come out the other side mm. i wasn't to know that it's going to take you know 10 plus years but that sort of still drove and as i grew and my um you know experience and responsibilities grew and i became more of a leader you know that dream and that vision became like yeah, there was more weight behind it kind of thing i felt a lot more responsibility to you know see that through and um i think that's what ultimately motivated me was to get out the other side you know there's sort of two choices multiple times like do you stay and uh you know fight your way through it and hope that we can come out the other side and help lead and help change and um and will that bring genuine joy and fulfillment mm. or can I just jump ship and you know join up in another club almost you could single-handedly at one point pick where you wanted to go and probably play in a premiership or play, at least play finals regularly but for me that never really sat well it's like mm. what uh you know what substance is is to that um and would that bring me f total fulfillment and joy and I was I could never consider that mm. I was just like I want to see this through because coming out the other side of this, it'd be like, wow, epic, that was yeah. like that whole journey was epic, and that was like, uh, yeah, that's why you did it, kind of thing. Wow, and that's so what that's what motivated me. You never got close to considering it, like no, nah, yeah. like yeah, there was times I'm not gonna lie, like yeah. there was times with my wife where I was like, fuck this, I'm done, like, and I like think I'm anyone saying, would like, blame the emotional that. Yeah, toll yeah. was like big, like it was a lot of. Uh, you know, it's a heavy burden at times where you just like, because you know, when I didn't have kids and stuff, like you live and breathe footy and like, and everyone around you and those close to you, particularly within the inner sanctum of your own life, live and breathe it. And they ride the bumps with you. Um, and my wife, I've been with my wife since you know, the end of year 12. So she's been there the entire Full way. Time, yeah. um, and she sees what I put in and she sees the pain that you feel like, you know, post game or after a bad loss. It was funny, like, there's times where you're just so embarrassed where you just don't want to, like, go out on the street, like, didn't want to go out in my Melbourne kit post-game and pick up, like, any sort of takeaway on the drive home because it's, like, for fear that, you know, people are judging you. But it was, it was a tough period there for sure. You just almost adapt your life because it was like you were embarrassed at how bad your footy team was mm. <laughs> and that you played for them kind of thing. And I, I know a lot of players that struggled through that period because it's, like, it's not what you envisage or imagine, but we came out the other side. You did. It's hard, isn't it? Because we, you know, we speak about this a lot, but <clears throat> separating like the person from the persona, yeah. like you're getting pumped every week. Everyone's talking shit, which, you know, rightly or wrongly so. 
but then you start to believe that yeah. and you go well like I'm a good person just because I'm not performing or my team's not performing doesn't mean like I'm a shit bloke yeah man and you, you get in those real bad battles with yourself what I struggled with most was like attaching my self worth to like accolades or mm. um, or like you know the opinion of people or you know the respect of the competition or other teams or opposition players and that kind of thing uh, rather than like um, and I guess what that did it sort of fostered you know um, a real roller coaster of emotion like I went through some good periods where I got some good results but really that never brought me fulfillment it was like I was chasing this never ending cycle of like yeah. you know I just I want our team to be respected I want our club to be respected I want to be respected you know I want to get you know I want to be you know seen in the light of the good players I want our club to be seen in the light of the best teams rather than sort of um I guess chasing the thing that really brings you joy inside and I think that's what you know Goody did and Rusey did and Peter Jackson did and that and Goody in particular sort of harnessed that with the current group around finding what your higher purpose is mm. like yes we're all playing to win but why are we playing to win kind of thing and you know it all boils down like everyone plays footy for that 30 minutes where you celebrate the wins with your family and friends and teammates and you sing the song and you just sit in the rooms and soak that moment up kind of thing that's what you play for you know mm. not the w or not the wet uh not the medal or not even necessarily the trophy you know yeah it's interesting 100 percent. you know one thing um i find really interesting and this is actually a question for you is like we had max Gorn on the show like last year and he's talking a lot about um about the d's and like you know what what has changed in his time you know being there and we spoke about, like there's a lot of talk about the talent that you know, we're sort of coming through with him and, and guys that unfortunately didn't make it. And, you know, we all know you know those sort of guys, like the really good players, high picks, like, you know, Jordan Gisberts and, um, you know, Lucas Cook, all these sort of guys who were really good players. I played with against them and with them, but unfortunately didn't, you mm. know, make it on and, and what it was. And he sort of referred to the pact of, like, Melbourne maybe didn't have, like, a right development at that stage yeah, to get those sure. players. For sure. You say for sure, but, like, there's also a part of it now too. Like, I was thinking about that and I look at you. And I was like, well, that didn't... Yeah, but there's not many... Certain, like, didn't really work for you, did it? Yeah, yeah. Well, like, I, not, not to give them an out or anything. No, like, no, there's more I just, think... There's two uh, different like, ways I've, I've about had it. this discussion with a few boys, Max being one of them, like, you know, a lot of us are like, uh, you know, similar sort of personalities, you know, like... Mm. But not everyone's like that. And that was one of the great lessons I learned as a leader, like, you know, initially when I was captain early days, it's like, or even in the leadership group and as vice captain before being there, like everything to me was black or white. Like if yeah. you weren't like me and you didn't do stuff like me and you didn't have a high kind of standard like me and or to that kind of expectation, like it would really grind my gears and I'd get real frustrated and, um, and I would fire up kind of thing. But as I sort of gained perspective and invested more in sort of understanding myself and then others and how people are different and sort of learnt to understand empathy a bit more you know that my perspective really shifted and changed mm. and that's why I say yeah for sure because I look at the program that we had you know even the last five years not just the premiership year like there was a, there was a lot of work that led to that um, and that fostered the differences in people and it allowed them to come to training at, be at the club and be who they are mm. And still push them to have like really high standards and you know i guess strive to be better and be the best that didn't mean that they had to all be the same person you know oh, what i mean so true um and that's why you know you look back and i think that's where we might have gone wrong at different times it's like try, try and um sort of uh you know tarnish everyone with the same brush kind of thing but that's just not how how society is and i think that's why i think coaching in particular has evolved to sort of now encompassing so much more of like relationships and connection and understanding people and that's how you actually get the best out of them like you know I, you listen to all these old commentators like they should be copping a spray but yeah it's just like it's not it doesn't work it's for not everyone. the best yeah. way to do it you know um 
And I, I learned that. Like at one point I was like that and then I went through this whole sort of, you know, off the back of everything I went through, the journey from a footy perspective, I sort of went on a parallel personal kind of journey as well where you understand yourself better and, you know, I really wanted to develop in that leadership space because in a way I didn't feel like, you know, with the sort of exodus of a lot of senior guys, there was a lot of uh, expectation put on a lot of us um, that were ill-equipped and you know probably not experienced enough already to even be in some of those positions so yeah you know jack grimes jack trengove probably two of the prime examples really um you know captains at 21 and can't remember how old um grimes he was at the time but low 20s as well so yeah i think uh for me it was like if you're not sort of uh sheltered by the seniority like i needed to develop myself and um I think Max is of a similar ilk with his own personality. He's very self-driven. Tom McDonald's another one. Neville Jett is another one. Jack Viney's another one. All guys that sort of had seen or lived some of or a lot of that that dark time. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I nah. think now it's like it's it's you look at it and I think the way they do it now is far better than the way it used to be done. Fuck man, it's such a it's such a good point. Like I um I think I'm no way near the, the highest standards that you have but similar to that sort of mindset it's like you, if you don't work hard fuck you or whatever it yeah. is and you can have that and I, I remember I watched this um this video on YouTube recently and it was like because I, I need to get better one of my things I'm really focusing on is like empathy and like putting yourself in someone's shoes mm. and, and not like judging people it's just like just trying to understand people yeah. more and exactly that point and there's this video it's unbelievable I'll, I'm going to put in the show notes and I'll explain it now but it was talking about um, emotional intelligence and was saying that uh, it gives a case study of there's a, there's a homeless man and there's two types of people that walk past and there's one guy who walks past and he's like, you know, come from a um, broke family. He's um, done, you know, everything himself. He believes in like Greek mythology where it's like, you know, can, um, conquer or be conquered and um, the homeless guy asks for money and he goes, well, why the fuck would I give you money? He goes, I've gone out, worked my ass off and like I've done everything to make this money like why would I give it to you mm. anyway the next guy comes past and he's come from um, a, a quite a well off family and he's learnt like you know that he's extremely grateful and um, he's been blessed and you know he's grown up to give back so the person you know identifies in it that this guy hasn't had the luck that I've had I need to give back to you and you know to, to support and there's no right or wrong but the message in the video was you've got to understand both of them and yeah. they're both valid yeah. and you've got to understand more that people have different outlooks on mm-hmm. life and you can have one and other people can have other but it's like how you can put yourself in both shoes yeah. to understand it yep. I was like fuck that is unbelievable yeah, like, absolutely, it was such man. a good like little thing because it fucks you in your head because you're on that one yeah. and then you're like oh fuck I'm wrong you yeah. know like, you're like it's not, it's not about being deep, one that's yeah. like if you yeah. think about the societal like split that we've had in the last few years of like you know, COVID and vaccines and all this kind of stuff. Mm. It's like, like just split society yeah. in two. Like you're either one side or the other rather than like, I don't care what you do, man. You do you and I'll do me. And yeah. You can see my point from your perspective and I'll see yours from mine. And, you know, we don't have to hate each other for it, but it was yeah. like dividing friendships and communities and well, even with the, the families. The like the it's crazy. Government stuff of late. Like it's the exactly. same thing. Exactly. It's like, the same it, thing. People want to force, like I, I'm not really into politics and I felt bad for not being into it because I was like, I need to have an opinion. <laughs> I was like, fuck, I just, you know, it wasn't yeah, something that I was super into, but mm. you're so right. Um, I'm going to link that video because I think it is like seriously one of the best things I've seen in that, in that space because like, it's exactly what you said, exactly your journey, exactly the journey like I'm on. It's probably a lot of people are on that yeah. too. It's, um, yeah, it's really, really cool. I'll link it. Um, Dees as well. One thing I do want to ask you about and I, I'm not sure, it's, it is an uncomfortable time, but the, the tanking yeah man what was that like what yeah. was it like to be a part of that because like yeah, i'm that, sure like you obviously weren't aware of what was going on no, at the time like, but like, uh, well in some way maybe you were like like looking back i guess when we we're in it but then now you like look back and think yeah god that was weird yeah like so there's like when i can't even remember when it was like what was oh like, there's some just some random games like i don't know like i think the most obvious one would be the one against Tigers or something? Yeah, that yeah. one was weird. Like, I just remember some weird moves late in the game and then they end up winning and it was like, 
like why did that happen kind yeah. of thing but there was one where I didn't play and it was like we played Carlton at Eddie had I think it was and um, and yeah I reckon uh, James Frawley was playing on Favola mm. doing a pretty good job but then they switched that and Tom McNamara young like rookie play, rookie backman played on Fev and Fev ended up kicking like eight or something and Mark Jamer was a ruckman I think he was playing forward he was actually kicking a fair few goals but like I don't know it was just like I look back and I'm like were they trying to like because we were down the bottom like were they trying to teach him or like, I don't know like yeah. it's just there's just a lot of instances like that where you're just like questioning moves or decisions and you would be like what the hell like but anyway but I guess like when you're immersed in it at the time like I I wasn't going out there to lose and yeah. I know I damn well sure know none of the boys would have nah. been doing that but you just I think looking back now with a fresh perspective you're like there's some was weird. weird stuff yeah. which I think is why the AFL looked right into it and um, I think pretty sure the club got heavily sanctioned for it yeah that was weird that was super weird it's like such a credit to the Melbourne now to be able to like turn around like it's still crazy in my mind which we'll get into soon how fucking good oh, your man. club is which is crazy question before that though I was um speaking to my mate Kate Simpson who it's a bit like yourself like incredible players stayed you know so loyal to clubs and I was talk- talking to him the other day about it and I was like you know what's crazy is the fact that if the club was successful at this time there's so many players along that journey that you've played with mm. that if the club was successful they'd be household names and would be these players that would have fit into premiership teams and just played incredible roles but they yeah. probably didn't get the credit they deserve yeah does any names like besides yourself well you're obviously well already well known but does any players jump out you going fuck this guy was just so good but never probably got the right time it was just the wrong place wrong time at the club oh i think the real good ones either move on or survive kind of thing mm. um in our case like there's probably this you know I feel most for guys like Jack Grimes, Jack Trengove, probably those two in particular. Yeah. Um, they'd be the most obvious ones in my own mind, just thinking about both their journeys. I think Jack um, Trengove, like obviously the luck with his injury. His foot, yeah. Like he could have been anything with yeah. how good he was early days. And, um, and yeah, obviously... You know, I, I didn't really think too much at the time. I felt like, you know, the um, the captaincy was the right decision with him. Like, he's he was such a good player, great leader. But then he just gets, um, you know, a terrible injury that sort of influenced his ability to run yeah. and take off and all those kind of things and struggle with it for some time. And Grimesy, on the flip side, just like, you know, when you're really struggling, it's like you, you sort of never really find your niche and you know he was played in a few different roles and obviously the expectation pressure of captain and yeah i just would have liked to see both those guys get a real good hit at it mm. you know there's times where i sort of and i'm sure a lot of guys that would have got drafted to our club and were sort of in and out I'm like fuck why don't i go there kind of thing like yeah <clears throat> wish it had panned out a bit different um you know I, one of my good mates rowan bale he was an awesome player as I well him, like yeah. i loved him like and I feel like he would have been a terrific player in another team. And there was a fair few guys that similar to him. Like Matt Jones was another one that we had, was showed glimpses, but you know, we were a team that was improving and, you know, he's a sort of more mature age recruit. That period was it sucked and for a lot of the guys yeah. that um it was almost like a hole there, like I go to the past players stuff and like not many guys come back from that period. And it's like like that's the bulk of my career. It's like you know, there's a f- sort of a group of guys I'm close with from right at the start. And then there's like a period where... Yeah, it's fucking hard. There's not many at all. Yeah. Um, there's a few boys that I'm still really close with, but we were best mates, irrespective of whether we played footy together kind of thing. Um, and then you transition into that sort of new era. And I was already... And that's one thing I really struggled with. I spoke to my wife about this the other night. Like, you know, for all the footy disappointment, like how many of our friends like left went to other teams or were sort of in the club for a couple of years you build a great relationship with them and then they're gone and then like you know it's like when, when you're on the sort of footy train you just keep going it's yeah. like you're living a very different life to what everyone else is and it's like all different times and yeah 
different focuses and yeah, even leaving a club you think oh the boys are gonna miss me man yeah, and then yeah. you're just like no they don't well that's <laughs> why i noticed that not long ago like i i did the um anzac eve game for channel seven it's first time being back inside the club yeah. and obviously the d's one i was down the rooms after and i was like it was oh, so good, good to, to boys, just be yeah. around all the boys but it's like you walk away from that it's like they're just in their own little bubble own kind of bubble thing. man um, yeah oh for sure super switched on guy like and i i, I knew this and we've chatted a bit about it today but like your per- own personal journey o- away from footy is something that i'm super interested in now because we've sort of touched on it a bit about like you know the, the growth that you've had because of what has been happening with the d's what were some of the best sort of tips or techniques or even just like epiphanies or crucible moments where you were like that got you through those times and you were like fuck this is what i need to do yeah i think um well a lot of it came through feedback like initially you know i was in a position as captain but felt like I could be even better. And a lot of my feedback personally came around like being less intimidating and, you know, I guess... Like as a approachability type thing? Yeah, or absolutely. Yeah. Like From other know, teammates? 100%. Yeah. Like, um, <clears throat> which is sort of going back to what I was saying before. Yeah. Like, I was my only like highway, that because yeah. it was like black or white for me. Yeah. Like, if we want to be good, we have to do this kind of thing. And if you strayed from that, I was like, you're not on the, you're not on the train with us kind of thing. But, you know, the more feedback I got around being more approachable and, um, and I guess letting down my guard a little bit, which I think was almost like a bit of a survival mechanism through going through f- like a fair few years of the pain and struggle that was involved mm-hmm. in being down the bottom for so long. So, yeah, I just uh, I sort of t- started to take that on board and just I really opened myself up to, I guess, speaking to people and... Um, you know, I guess learning and listening and because I probably know I probably underestimated the influence I had on yeah. people. Um, I, I like, I never really saw it the way they would explain it to me kind of thing. Like, like you don't realize that how much, how many people will like respect you and look up to you. But I would, I would always downplay that. Be like, nah, I don't, I don't feel that kind of thing. But I try to open myself up to that a little bit. And, um, I, yeah, I just went on a bit of a journey. Like I started probably mainly under Ruzi because Ruzi yeah. was like probably one of the first coaches where I felt like he really believed in me. And it, on the flip side of that, he genuinely had empathy for the journey that I'd been through yeah. to that point. Yeah. And so he found a way to sort of connect with me on another level as far as like he gained my trust and in turn, he really challenged me. And I guess from that moment on was when I really started to go, um, you know, down that path of like trying to be the best version of myself. And this wasn't just as a footballer. This was now like as a leader and as a person and as a husband and as a friend and all that kind of stuff. And a lot of that was focused around him challenging me about team. Mm. Um, what do you say? Like, what was the conversation? Yeah, you know, so it was like it was a game where like. Obviously, at the time, I was like one of our better players coming off two or three best and fairest, mm-hmm. and he challenged me. Like, three best and fairest. He's like, oh, you're going to tag Mark Murphy this weekend. And I was like, and you, like, normally that would happen to me, but he was like flipping the um, yeah. story in my own it's mind. A, it's it's like a hit to the, it is hit to the ego. Yeah, really. like, I yeah. was like, what? Like, I'm the captain and like one of our best players. Like, why do I have to do that kind of thing? But like there was method to that, and um, and you know I didn't say too much. I was just like a bit frustrated by it, but I was like, oh fucking show him, like I'll be able to do both. Like I'll stop him and I'll play real well. And uh, I probably played one of my best games for the year. That game, I think I had like thirty and kicked one, and kept Mur- uh, Murph to like under twenty touches, and they were like wrapped, like. And I sort of downplayed it at the start, but then the more I thought about it, I'm like, I could see exactly what he's doing. Like, and it was it took me as the captain to be able to sort of show an element of vulnerability and challenge myself in a way that I haven't normally been challenged before to mm. to sort of open myself up to the rest of the team to sort of come on board. And and once I sort of understood that message, we we sort of broke it down in review on the on the monday i was like why'd you do that to me kind of thing yeah. and we sort of went through it and the more i was like yeah I, I get it kind of thing um and it was like a real shift in my mentality like i was super driven personally but now it was like a new drive for me to 
not only play super well myself, but bring other guys along um, and and you know, sort of show them the way kind of thing. And uh, I guess from that moment on was like, all right, then I I need to listen to the feedback I'm getting from my teammates. I need to be more vulnerable. I need to be more open, more approachable. And I just worked worked on that. Like in some cases, early days is maybe a little bit awkward, you know, putting myself up in front of the group or speaking up more or you know, I guess reaching outside of my own little bubble or friendship group. To, mm. But yeah, that was... Uh, super beneficial as far as i guess you know helping develop the direction of culturally where we wanted to go as a team and a club um and yeah i just sort of found people along the way that helped me i hooked in with the um a couple of guys and worked a lot on sort of uh this is sort of back on my own sort of self um development stuff like uh worked a lot on understanding my own intuition kind of thing and just like listening to my own inner voice mm. which was cool because what's that what what do you mean by that I like, that. like sort of through like uh like taking a breath in a moment and just like really sitting with it and like and uh and like i guess trusting your self kind of thing mm. um and like if I was to sort of tie it into where my mentality was through those tough years, it was like my self-worth was linked to results. And no matter you know whether I achieved or the team achieved, like that never really brought me any sort of fulfillment. And then going through this process, it was like I no longer sort of linked it to that. Like I, was, I had a new sort of perspective on things. Um, I saw things in a different light kind of thing. And... Um, I guess that's probably what helped me had I not gone through that journey and then I fast forward to what happened in the last 12 months. Mm. I sort of think back and like, you know, if I had have, hadn't have had that sort of emotional intelligence that I uh, had worked on over, you know, three or four years prior, I would hate to have seen sort of how I handled the situation in the past. But I guess that's the progression of my own sort of development and um you know that was important for me particularly as a leader of the footy club to take that journey and um yeah i'm, I'm pretty grateful for it because it hasn't only it didn't only impact my footy career and probably extended it to a certain degree yeah um i was just about to say that because i think just on that point i when you say like how you would have handled last year i don't reckon if you had have changed it you probably wouldn't have been playing footy because nah. like, i know i was a little fuckwit like yeah that when i was playing and it took me to like lose it yeah, to, man. to wake up. So yeah. you, you probably would have finished two, three years earlier. A hundred percent. And I think that's like, I sat down, that's what I was saying before, I sat down with one of the guys that I caught up with was a uh, big wave surfer, um, Mark Visser. I just got a, he was a hookup sort of through the club. He'd done a little bit of stuff. He, mm. he runs like courses on breathing and, um, and a lot of this sort of mental skills kind of stuff. Um, and I spent some time with him and yeah, he, and we clicked because of the common interest with surfing and but yeah i just spent a lot of time with him really sort of diving into it like way beyond what he would sort of workshop with the group and and wanted to like understand it really well from my own perspective and like break down why i sort of thought certain ways and what i attached to different emotions and that mm. kind of thing which is kind of cool but like because I really got to understand myself particularly in different situations and how i react to certain things and like why i bite or snap or and yeah like as i said you know it helped me with my leadership and um you know as far as becoming more approachable and it's funny i almost went full circle because then that feedback was like um you know towards the back end of my career it was you know the time and effort i spend with all the young boys and the relationships i have with them and and I was like, and that gave me so much joy. Um, and when I was about sort of 30, I started to think, you know, my career may be coming towards an end. I need to sort of widen my perspective on life and things and had a couple of kids at that point. And so I was sort of like felt like I'd mellowed out a bit from being sort of that young and super driven and just kind of sharp edged young fella. Mm. And I got some great advice from, uh, I sat down with um, Chris Judd one day and he was like, uh, you know, one of the great things he did, you know, in the back couple of years of his career was like invest heaps in other people. And I was like that time, the timing of that came perfectly with like sort of all the stuff I was kind of going through. 
so I really invested into that and um, it was just so surprising that you know the more you did that you know the more mm. you kind of got back in return for sure love it listen to this I'm sure you I'm not sure if you've heard this Max Gorn was on the Imperfects have you listened to the episode? I haven't listened to it yet okay interesting very good looks great for us I want to play you a clip that he said about you if we're asking Nathan Jones was going to miss out on a grand final yep. to go teach Tom Sparrow what Nathan Jones has learnt throughout his career, even though Tom Sparrow's taken your spot in the grand final. Oh, I didn't know that. Was that really but what... That's what football clubs are. If yeah. you're an older player, you're expected to teach the younger player everything you know about the game and craft them to be a better player. I mean, so I've got a young ruck now, Luke Jackson, who is already a better player than me. It's phenomenal. Well, I don't know about that, but he's very, very good. <laughs> and, I'm, and I'm trying to teach him everything I can, knowing full well that he will then take my spot. And it's, I mean, sure, it happens in most industries as well. Well, but not, well yeah. Not, not, not explicitly like that. No. And it's public as well. So mm. people watch it happening. I mean, the Nathan Jones situation, for those of you who don't follow football, club legend, 300 games. He's been through the, the, through the toughest of times with the Demons. And it was almost like the biggest fairy tale was for him to play in the grand final, but he wasn't picked. I spent so much time during the grand final thinking about him. Mm. Like I just couldn't help it. And I, and I know, and I do know him, which is like adds a bit to that. But I, but I, but I was like, this is, mm. I mean, every interview he does, of course he's so happy, but he must be heartbroken. He must be absolutely heartbroken. He, he would have had to bite his tongue for the first four or five weeks. Um, he's, he's a great, great friend of mine as well, but it shows the caliber of a man to be able to teach someone your tricks and be fully supportive of them. And they've taken your spot after you played 300 games with one of the most unsuccessful teams of all time, Mm -hmm. Melbourne from 2006 to 2018. And that's it. Well, yeah, that's basically what happened really. Mm. Um, For sure. Uh, You know, once when I stepped away from being captain end of 2000 and what, uh, yeah, end of 2019, so we played 18 prelim. That was an unreal year. Sort of uh, out of nowhere, we just got on this uh, epic roll and played a couple of finals. Some of the best moments and best times I've had playing footy ever. Um, and I still remember seeing Sweet Caroline was like our uh, sort of team anthem. Just, and after every win, we'd like sing it in the rooms, like full on bellow it out. Like it was so good. And obviously, I remember the moments like kicking that goal against Geelong was like mm. almost like signified. You know, for me, that was like that was that typified my dream of like what I had hoped we could one day get back to, and yeah, that was irrespective of whether we won the premiership or not. But it was just like playing a final twelve years after I'd played in my last final. But to see the G's going off tap with mm. Melbourne supporters that believe in us again, kind of thing, that like that's all that's what I had dreamt about for so long. That got me through so many dark days, kind of thing. It's why I got out of bed and you know dragged my ass through some of that tough time. Yeah, when I when I stepped away from the captaincy, I th- I think that's like, and that sort of goes back to the discussion I was telling you before with Chuddy about sort of investing in others, because um, I knew I was like at that point like. I'm 30-ish, I can't remember. Yeah, I would have been 30. And I was like, how am I, like, I need to find ways. I can't just keep doing the same thing over Mm. and over again. Like, it's got me this far, but I don't think if I keep doing it, it's going to get me much further. And that's where that's that whole sort of, you know, mental skills, self-development, you know, investment in others, giving rather than taking kind of mentality came into it. And um, and it was a huge... Um, element of like vulnerability within all that and uh, and I sort of half knew that you know it may or may not happen for me and you know after 18 and then the disappointment of 19 where we've gone from a prelim to finishing second bottom Mm. I was like maybe this is never gonna happen kind of thing like and I knew there's gonna be an element of a build back because like if we were gonna go on we should have gone on with it in 18 but we dropped the ball a little bit bumbled around for a couple of years but um i guess my mentality really shifted into trying to fast track all of these young guys that we had like there's so many talented guys like because if they get better we might I'll, like i might get one more shot at yeah. playing finals kind of thing 
and uh and that was like that was my goal really was like yeah. to try and impart as much of my leadership and experience on those young guys get really involved because i wasn't involved in the leadership group stuff anymore which was a weight off my shoulders was get involved in trying to foster their development and growth you know what i love about this and i hope this makes sense and it sort of makes sense to me i was like listening to something the other day i was talking about bravery and i was saying like bravery isn't actually being scared of something like bravery is being scared and then do and still doing it yeah and i think like in reference to that is you being a good bloke in this situation isn't just about you being a good bloke it's actually you wanting it so bad but you do but then you still be a good bloke yeah, as yeah. well. I've seen that exact scenario yeah. happen before. And it's a bit like what Max was saying. For me, it was like, you know, I spoke a lot to Goody, to like once I gave away the captaincy around like what legacy could I leave, like whether or not I I um, you know, play in a premiership or not, mm. or we play finals again or not. And this is sort of going back to 2000, end of 2019. I sort of went back to when I last signed like a long-term deal under Ruzi when I was in that first year's cap- captain on my own. I signed four years and I had already had a year. So it was like a five-year commitment. I was like, I may never play in a premiership, but the one thing I want is for no one that comes into this club to ever go back through a period like we had yeah. for the majority of my career. Because I've just seen so many guys come and go and not many of us survived. And I was like, that's not how your AFL career and dream should go kind of thing. So if I wasn't a winner flag, at least the club would hopefully be in a better place. And if I could influence that in any way, yeah. like that was my goal kind of thing. That's pra- practically what how it panned out really. That's <laughs> awesome. Yeah. I hope I nailed my point earlier because I was meaning as well, like exactly what you're saying then, but it's all well and good to want the best for your teammates and that's great. But I think it's more powerful, like actually still wanting to play yourself being dogged about it but then still helping them oh yeah like, don't worry i was got, doing that yeah, hardcore exactly. training. that's that's what you're doing like, it like, was, um, you know it's not saying that you're just there to help them like you're yeah. still going no fuck you I'll oh still yeah take your spot like oh 100 yeah. percent um yeah. but i'm gonna help you as well yeah for sure but we knew like we fostered that um within the footy club like yeah. for sure like um you know we spoke a lot in that premiership year of like it ain't the 22 on a field it's actually the, the 44 guys in the list and there was a huge amount of like competitive um, like training and match play and it got heated at times. And I was at the forefront of that for sure because I was fighting for my career kind of thing. Mm. But that didn't mean that once that was said and done, I couldn't sit down and review and or help. like training ended and I can help you with some technical stuff or we yeah. can have a chat about like what your aspirations are or some advice on leadership, like any of that kind of stuff. Like you're always open to that. And I think finding that balance is so important. That's why Melbourne is so good right now. Like, mm culturally they've just got this like it's dog eat dog internally as far as like it's hard to get a spot in the 22 and i guarantee every training session is like ultra competitive with guys wanting to you know put their case forward but they're doing it for the right reasons um and they've got such a depth of talent that it's just driving the level and that's, that's why it's hard to see you know many teams beating them yeah and that's why i love it's the magic though that all the best teams have and yeah. it's like um how do you harness that? I don't know. I don't, I don't know. I think, like, I think footy's the... I, I think it's the biggest myth in the world. Yeah. Some shit. Like, people are like, you have to have this, you have to have that. It's like, you know what? You just need to do it and then it just works. Like, there's no formula. Yeah, there's honestly there isn't. no formula. No. If, you, if people say they do know the formula, they're absolutely <laughs> lying. I think one thing just on, on your point though, like, as, as a Melbourne, as one thing I'd love to get across today is like, that I'm so impressed with is like, you've gone, like, look at how you've grown. Your trajectory of your growth has been melbourne's trajectory of their growth and whether that's your impact on melbourne or melbourne's impact on you you've grown together Mm. you've both been that pig-headed at the start going fuck you it's my way the highway you've changed your mindset and you've put that through the leadership and then that's changed the club's outlook on things so like your your impact not even in the finals but i think like the five years six years before is probably one of the most underrated things on that journey yeah i Um, I appreciate that which is huge (laughs) it is it's really big because it's like you you're being here now saying you weren't actually the as good as you should have been early days with it and that's where the club was at too yeah it's all good well and good saying like the good parts now but there's so much happened before it which is exciting and that's what i like to to look at anyway it's so Mm. cool really cool what was it like watching the granny i know obviously tough but yeah 
happy um oh yeah for sure i said <laughs> no, i said, no, no. said this publicly <laughs> like um oh it had been a big week or two like um like leaving perth was it close how, sorry just on that like how close was it to actually happening was it was there any discussion around oh form? like like my form had been unreal to be honest like yep. you know i probably played some of the best footy i played in a few years but that sort of coincided with the team just playing, playing so well really well. well yeah um and spots were tight and you know obviously it's you know it's subjective to sort of coaches and roles and all that kind of thing and that's just how that's the way the game works kind of thing yep. um i sort of look at it as like right place wrong time kind of thing for me yep. personally but at least i can walk away and know i gave us gave absolutely everything like the time i put into the season was like huge mm. particularly the pre-season because i sort of knew when i signed on for that one year i thought we could be good we'd done a s- extensive review of the footy department we we're on our way in 2020 but if they got a few things right i was like i was super optimistic like probably the most i had been i was like i reckon we can turn this around real mm. quickly there's just something about it like that's there's a smell about it being good um and that was all through that sort of covid hub period and we were we we progressed a bit that season and I put so much time into my diet, my body and ended up playing the first seven games of the year, my 300th, which I was sort of real, you know, grateful for because it was like almost, uh, I guess for all the time and effort that no one saw, um, I felt, I really felt like I earned those games. Yeah. And for yeah. a change in direction up post that where, you know, structurally they my position kind of got soaked up a little bit and you know i sort of had to go back to the drawing board and we had a discussion about going back just playing as a midfielder because i sort of been playing as a i'd been filling holes within the team but that left me vulnerable and i played as i said i played some of the best footy i'd played and i was on the cusp of being back in and i strained my calf like round 16 it was i reckon i i was sub and went and played vfl the next day and played like probably the best game I played in three years Fuck. but I strained my calf in the second quarter I wasn't 100% sure I'd done it but I played the game out and then tried to train main training that week and Bang. it was no good yeah, so that cost me and then to about round 18 or 19 I think it was so three or four three or four weeks I reckon and then <clears throat> I was emergency with my form but you know you look back at that was COVID started to come back so we weren't VFL season was finished. We were yeah. playing like these random games, like 15 v 15 on like smaller fields and stuff. But I was still playing out of my skin. It was super high quality as well. Like you can imagine like 15 v 15. It's like a bloody soccer game of like Which AFL. Is hard. Those still games players. are hard. They were hard they're harder than AFL games. They yeah. were hard. Um, and I'd have been emergency for all the way up until the, I was emergency all the way to, from that point. Once I got back and had played a couple of games, sort of round... 19, 20, 21, first two finals, I'd been emergency. Yep. Um, and yeah, I I knew that my, like as that wore on and no one sort of got injured and just the quality of footy we were actually playing, I, I was pretty aware that of where it all kind of sat, you know. And yeah, we got to the prelim and then <laughs> I'm sitting in the stand, I'd, I'd warmed up as, a, as an emergency again and well, that was just something else that... that much like the granny really like they could not have put a foot wrong yeah. and maxi put on an absolute that clinic. was that was i was like was I, was, I remember just we were all in like a private box and all of the boys were just <laughs> it's one of the it. funniest like things every I've goal he kicked we were just like oh my god like yeah just erupting um and yeah so the siren went and um no, i i knew really like mm. i probably knew at half time to be honest so i was yeah. like well, unless someone gets hurt I've got a pretty big decision to make in the next like 24 hours because mm. sort of running parallel to that was like we've been away for three weeks my wife's 35 weeks pregnant and for probably 10 days prior to the prelim she'd actually been in hospital here in melbourne obviously covid lockdown we've got another mm. two kids she can't leave the hospital like it, it's all heading towards babies are on their way and you know she needed to be monitored kind of thing so i knew that i was like I'm going to have to make a call after tonight. So I was like, I'll just celebrate with the boys and have a few beers and 
um, like there's a two week break to the granny. I'll wake up in the morning and just see if what what happens out of injury clinic. Yeah. But I knew no one was injured. Yeah. And I always I was like thinking in my own head as well, like I don't want anyone to be injured. You no, know, like yeah. imagine getting this far and hurting yourself. Like I feel for like. And it's like funny, like obviously my story is linked just through the history, but there's so many guys that could have been playing in our side. Like mm. there's probably five or six of us that were playing good enough to be in the team, but we were just going that well. And someone like a Jaden Hunt plays most of the year and does his uh, syndesmosis, I think it might have been his ankle, like yeah. a game or two before the granny. Yeah. So yeah, it's um, I sort of had a few beers and wines that night and, contemplated everything and woke up in the morning hung over as hell because I, I knew where it was heading <laughs> yeah. I knew where it was heading up I um oh, I reckon I got I, I couldn't get to sleep I got to sleep at like I reckon 5 a.m and my wife called me at 8 like I need an answer like shit's escalating yeah and I'm like oh, I was a bit frazzled because I was yeah. still half asleep <laughs> I'm like what do you mean what's going on what's going on like and she's like I need a fucking answer and I was like all right I was like I haven't heard that tone yet and yeah. like shit must be escalating and yeah like i knew i knew in my i knew inside like going back to that trust in my yeah. intuition i was just like i've got to make the call and go home like realistically i don't think the chance of me playing is there and if i was to play it someone's going to get injured in the next two weeks for me to get a game and i don't want that to happen and i'm not going to stay here and miss the granny and miss the birth yeah, of the yeah. twins yeah so yeah, I just, I made the decision like um, I knew what the lay of the land looked like for me personally from a footy perspective and I put my family first and got on a flight that afternoon. Like it all happened so fast, right. man. Like packed all my shit up from three weeks of being in Perth. Like it was all over the room in like half an hour, COVID test, flight. Yeah, you forget I barely got to see anyone either, yeah. which sucked because I knew what was coming. Like I know I was leaving Perth but I'm also leaving and this is it. Like, yeah, my, yeah. My career's done. Yeah. Even though I hadn't said that to anyone, like yeah. I knew inside, which became quite emotional when I was leaving because I was just like, fuck, this is it. Like I'm walking away from 16 years. Like it's not just missing the granny, which was killing me yeah. anyway. It was like, I'll never play AFL footy again kind of thing, which was hard. And then, yeah, I jumped on the plane, got delayed. Thank <laughs> thankfully, I got a COVID test. And I was like, Jerry, I'll be, I'll be sweet. I'm on my way home. I'll see you in the morning. And I ended up, as I said, got delayed and fuck, got back to Melbourne. Finally got to the jet base, got my car, got home, got in bed, seen, seen my other two kids. I hadn't seen them in like three and a half weeks. And I got a phone call at 5 a.m. Babies were due to come Monday, like scheduled cesarean. Got a phone call at 5 a.m. So I've got in bed at 12.30, 5 a.m. phone call. you got to come to the hospital oh, right God. now. From the nurse, I'm like, who's this? Hello. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so I got up, quick shower, straight in. Babies were born at 7 a.m. Fucking hell. That's so I've made it home by like, I don't know, six hours. That's or so. that whole like intuition thing. Yeah, man. Go. I was like, fuck, thankfully yeah. I made that call. Like I said to Jerry, once the babies were born, I was like, I'm so fucking what a good, grateful yeah, I'm here. Like I would, it would have sucked if I had been like, up in the air about the decision and then i'm sitting in a hotel room in Doing perth both. and i'm like i've missed both yeah um so yeah i'm i was super pumped about that and um that was a fun sort of first week and then i had to go through the whole i was like i'm gonna retire and then it sucked because it's like lockdown melbourne yeah. <laughs> i'm like how am i gonna fucking retire so like i'm sitting in my bedroom in zoom. I'm sitting in my bedroom yeah. at home with my my phone on a tripod <laughs> I can't even see everyone. Like, I'm just talking to the camera on my phone. I think, like, I had the phone facing so I could see my screen and I could see a little box and, like, the whole club's in there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah that's... But, you, like, <laughs> it's just so... It lacks so much connection because it's like you can't see anyone. Yeah. You can't hear... I couldn't hear anyone. could hear the odd laugh and stuff, but then yeah. I, like, you wrap the speech up and, like... All right, see you. Luck, yeah. boys. <laughs> <laughs> um, that was awkward, but I think from that moment it was, like, I could take a bit of a breath. Yeah. Um, I had like another week to just enjoy family time before the game, but I knew I'd find the game like tough, which, you know, I was super pumped for the boys and particularly for a lot of like Maxie, who I've known and, you know, played big role in. Um, and he's one of my great mates. 
I was fucking over the moon for him. But I was equally as devastated for like someone like Jake Melksham, who's one of my best mates, yeah. and he's in a similar position to me. Um, and he, you know, he's away from his family, and he's gonna go through. And you put all those boys that didn't play. You know, there's an element of them putting on a brave face because they're missing out on their childhood dream. But you're also super wrapped for the team because there's just so much time and effort we all put in to to be good. Mm. And we finally get a chance as a club and as an organisation and as a group of players. So we all contributed to it. There's no doubt about that. Uh, that's what that's what we adopted. What I was telling you before about look, it's not going to take 22; it'll take 44 of us to win a flag. And you hear that quite commonly from a lot of teams that win premierships. But yeah, I just sat on the couch, man. My baby's in bed. About fucking 12 beers. <laughs> and uh, I was a bit nervous at half time. I was like, Fuck. oh yeah. The like deep, when the, the Bont yeah. kicked a few, yeah, like Johannesson did he kick one? Yeah, yeah, can't remember, but um, I was like, fuck. But I'd, all, I'd always thought like I was messaging a few boys that were over in the ground in the in the players box, and um, like it sort of the grand final typified what Melbourne had done all year, really, yeah. just to a whole new level. Like we'd always been a team that sort of hung in, teams hung with us, and then we just grind away and bang, find a way to win. But they did that and some in the granny, and yeah. Like the boys in the middle in particular like track yeah crazy and track and clary and man it's hard like I, I one thing i do enjoy is just sitting back and admiring them like their development like i've seen them firsthand from the moment they walked in all the way to now and like both of them or there's a few of them like, did you think that'd be as good as they are oh they always had like clary came on a lot quicker than track yeah track sort of um it's like a little bit of inconsistency. But man, once he found his way as far as like standards and you know, his level as far as training and his body and I think a blessing in disguise was him doing his knee because yeah. it's like forced him to be I think he said that ultra actually, professional. Yeah. 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 And off the back of that man, he was like unstoppable. Yeah, it's pretty cool. It's all those boys are like Maxi and even though like Oh, there's so many stars in that team, man. Like, I guess what I, I look back now, and I was super wrapped um, as soon as the siren went. I was like, fuck, we've done it. Like, and I sat at home, like, supporting like a supporter, not like a teammate. Mm. It's like, fucking go. Like, particularly when we got a bit of a run on, we're coming back. And then once it's all over, I'm like, fuck, they've done it. Wow. And I didn't really consider my own sort of situation to probably. You know, I'd taken a few phone calls, FaceTime a few boys, and then I was just sitting on the couch in the lounge room, and I was just like, "Fuck, so close, but so far, like mm. it's done, and I've just like, it's like a year too late, kind mm. of thing." Um, which was tough, man. Like it, I probably from that moment on, I went down for probably a few weeks, I reckon, like because I I'd done like a heap of media leading up to it, and. I genuinely was super proud and stoked for our supporters and you know everyone that had been there through all of the shit mm. to finally see the club back in the position it was in. And as I mentioned before, you know, like all my teammates, like they're living their dream kind of thing. How can you not be fucking stoked for them? Like I saw all the effort they put in. I was there helping them along the way kind of thing. So I was fucking amped for them and hoping they could get the job done. But yeah, it was a few hours after the game where I started to just think of my own situation, which was tough. I, and it hit me real hard, like a lot harder than probably what I anticipated. Because it wears off. Yeah, like, like the the. Well, the I sort of like and the height wears off, and then you start internalizing. Yeah, absolutely. Like, like I, like for all of that, as you mentioned, like all of the hype, and I guess that the position I wanted to take as far as like my own messaging is yeah. like. I still felt responsibility to be, you know, a leader for the club kind of thing. But when all of that responsibility was shed and I just sat on my own in my lounge room, I was just like, that was the time where it just, my whole head was like full on spinning. Yeah. Um, and yeah, it was a, it probably took me a few weeks, I reckon. I know it's like a roller coaster of emotion. Like I was super happy to talk to guys on the phone. Then like an hour later, I'd be fucking devastated. Like, fuck yeah um that's another reason why i did the iron man because it was like if i keep going this way off the back of like how i feel right now like 
and I don't have any routine and I'm planning on taking some time off, like where does this sort of go? Like, um, and I didn't want to like spiral down into feeling real depressed about it because like I wasn't, but you know, I was also taking it pretty hard. So yeah, and it was basically probably two conversations really. I've, I've been mentored by Jared Healy for a lot of my career mm. and um, I spoke to him on the phone uh, a couple of weeks after. And he was like, mate, you've just got to look at it like, you know, football's like a chapter of your life. Like, it's not who you are. And, like, you close that chapter and now you have an opportunity to write a new one, irrespective of, like, what you achieved and all that kind of stuff. And, you know, it is that is what it is kind of thing. Now, like, go on the next journey. Don't let that sort of define you. Um, and don't live looking in the rearview mir- mirror your whole life kind of thing. And the more I thought about that, I was like, yeah, he's fucking right, like, for sure. And then my wife sent me, I actually pulled it up because I thought you'd ask me about it. She sent me a, um, like a thing on Insta. It was a quote from Maya Angelou. And she said, I've learned that people will forget what you said. People will forget what you did, but people will never forget how you made them feel. Mm. And like the more I thought about that, I was like, fuck, that's so true. Like the messages of... Um, the messages when I retired and post game were a lot from like the younger boys that I'd had a real impact on. And this like all came full circle to like the changes that I made and the journey that I kind of went on. And then it was like for a bit of a period, I like try to close myself off to that. Like I was like, nah, I was like super stubborn. And I was like going back to that old me of like my self-worth was attached to not winning a flag. But then I had like all of this fucking love over here for like, you know, I guess my efforts and my career and what I meant to people, but I would just push it away kind of thing. And it wasn't until she sort of mentioned that, that, and a few good friends of mine were like, mate, you need to like open yourself up to that. That I was like, all right, I'm going to like stake in the ground. It is what it is. I missed out. So be it. I'm just going to fucking open myself up to the love kind of thing. And, um, and yeah, that was like probably the most important moment where I was like, I appreciated my career for what I did and the journey that I'd been on and the, you know, how it had sort of shaped me as a person. And yes, I didn't win a premiership, but I think I finally found that ultimate fulfillment that I was talking about before yeah. came in the way I made people feel, whether that be our supporters, teammates, anyone sort of that I met along the journey that actually got to know me and understand who I was that they'll sort of always remember the impact or influence that you had on them and I was like that's what that's what means the most to me irrespective of whether I have a fucking premiership medallion or or you know I played in the game or not like I I've found what my fulfillment is kind of thing that's my journey um and then ultimately, like up since then, I've like shifting my mindset out of that few weeks of struggle and feeling sorry for myself almost. Man, life, life is good. That's awesome, man. I I just love everything you've said there. Like, I love the fact that sometimes, and I, I don't know what your thoughts are on this, but sometimes when like the the, the bad shit happens, we learn so much more from it. We end up being better in the long yeah. run. Versus, like, imagine this perspective, like this incredible perspective that you've got now. If you win the flag, you probably don't have that. Nah, I, I actually, so that's like, you sound like I swear I've heard that before. It's like yeah. deja vu. I reckon my wife said something real similar to me, mm. and I was like, so true. Like, you're probably not as like well-rounded you, person. Yeah, a hundred percent. Like, and that's, it sort of comes back to that. It's like the old adage of people like. You know they're they're struggling and they're you know they're facing difficult times. It's like I'm gonna buy a new car or yeah, it's the same sort of thing. Like I was fueling myself in completely the wrong way, kind of thing. And I think through my whole journey, it's like it's not even about that. It's more about the connections and how you made people feel, and that actually was the thing that brought me fulfillment. It allowed me to move forward. Whereas like if you win a flag, it's like what's the next thing, kind of thing. Whereas I almost felt like I could just be like, 
that's me. This is my career. And now I'm going to start a whole new journey. And I can't wait kind of thing without any sort of... I wasn't looking back in the rear view. I was now like, all right, let's go kind of thing. Like, took on the Ironman. And, um, and that was one good way to sort of take my mind off it. New challenge, new focus. And that sort of helped me take the steps through that next phase and I got to January and I wasn't taking 12 months off anymore I <laughs> took a fair few new opportunities that sort of came up and um and yeah now I'm pretty bloody happy like I've got a lot going on and you know I think I took the advice that Jared gave me around like rewriting the next chapter mm. rather than like forever looking in the rear view mate uh, that's incredible it really is um I thank you for being so open and honest. like i seriously forgot we're even doing a podcast and i was just like <laughs> listening to it because I, I it's a it's a message that i need to hear at the moment mm. too and it's one of those things that i found it's like as much as you sometimes think back like before when you say you have that that pivotal moment when you're playing you think oh i've worked it out this is what it is mm. but you can consist like a year later you forget it and then it comes back yeah. like, it's not something you learn once and it's just there like and i find that a lot sometimes i have these conversations and this one today is really like just i needed to hear exactly that at the right time because like i'm always thinking fuck i i need to learn this stuff i need to be more grateful for this i'm like but fuck i thought i knew that and <laughs> yeah. then you just like you just keep yeah, learning yeah. it you that's know? like you just, just got to be super conscious of it yeah. like that's uh that's the one thing i learned like that's what goes back to that intuition stuff and like just opening your perspective up because a lot of life you just like got the blinkers on like mm. i'm going this way and you almost like block out a lot of you know, important information that can you know, shape a new view or you know widen your perspective and yeah i'm so I, i'm real in the end i look back i'm, I'm real grateful for all those challenges yeah. i try to climb the peak and get to the top of the mountain um in a sense i i did you know i don't have the premiership to show for it but you know i um you know i feel like i'm in a super happy position and you know i have the fulfillment inside which is what i'd been chasing for so long yeah oh mate it's i i couldn't have asked to, or even got that story any better like that was unbelievable the way yeah you've worked that out and it's not about the grand final like it's nearly turned out better in mm. the long run for you personally mm. like it, yeah it's awesome man i really really appreciate it like I think um, without getting too deep on it, like I, you're an incredible person. Story today has been unbelievable. Your own personal journey is even more um, exciting than your football one. And um, maybe just credit to yourself. Just so honoured to have you on the on the podcast. Thanks, bro. Um, so excited to see what happens next with you. It's going to be very, very <laughs> oh, good no, things. Man, I'm busy, huh? Yeah. Like four kids. Yeah. Even if you want like... me to teach you how to run, <laughs> I, can, no. I can do that. I've got you it's coming. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, what's next? What's next? Oh, man. I'm super busy right now. Do you now. want to get back into footy? Nah, nah, neither. Not really. <laughs> not that I'm getting. Any oh, I'll play the Carlton like, Draft game. Yeah, Carlton yeah. Draft game. Port Arlington. Port Arlington. Get down to Port, Port Arlington that's Demons. A, It'll be top, July, early July. I'm going to come down to that because that's my uncle Jeff Miles. Yeah, coaching. that'll be good fun. Yeah, I should. Um, I won't have to strap on the boots. With <laughs> you should actually. Can you? No. Um, <laughs> that'll be. I'm looking forward to that. That'll yeah. be fun. That's been a fun um, kind of thing to be a part yeah. of. And yeah, no, not much, man. I'm super busy with the kids. Yeah, kids are like take up all my time yeah. which is epic my son's like right into footy now which is cool and yeah like school drop off go to work <laughs> man i'm just living the normal good, like yeah. dad life um but it's good times awesome brother thank you so much honor to meet you um officially thanks bro we're your friends now <laughs> 100 okay i love it <laughs> thanks brother cheers man <laughs>